So you can see from the title there is wherever you go, may Jesus be with you. And so I got some scriptures about that, about the big picture, as they say, or the, the macro picture of, of life or reality or the existence of man. And then I finish off with some scriptures that we can take personally to ourselves in our own life. And especially regarding the fact that you're making a move now. I feel like the, the Lord put it on my heart to address that subject. So you have some thoughts to go with you as you go. You know, Suzanne and I, we believe things that are common or not that everyone believes. We believe our Father is someone who loves us and He's here to care for us and to teach us. I mean, He can't help you much if you don't trust Him. But He is there for those who trust Him to believe and to know that He He goes with us and He does ha live, allow us to have free will. He's not micromanaging our lives. He's not dictating every single microsecond of it and making sure we dot all the I's and cross all the T's. He just wants to be with us when we do it. That's our that's our frame of reference where we come from. We believe that he is not a God that is basically the bureaucrat in the sky who wants to make sure we fill out everything in triplicate before we move forward. He just wants to go with us. So he gives us that freedom to do things, have that freedom and make our own decisions and just be comforted by the fact that we're not alone when we do it. Because if it, if it counts on us doing the right thing at all times, you can imagine the chaos that would cause. But now I just see that He's my father, he's present with me, and he just wants to go with me. Yeah, sure, he guides me. If there's a dangerous thing, I think if I'm listening to him, he probably guides me away from dangerous things. But there's a whole smorgasbord of things to do in life. And if I want to be an architect, he's there. If I want to be an architect, if I want to be a bus boy, he's there with me when I'm a bus boy. What I'm doing isn't the point. The point is who we're doing it with. So all that said, I just want to jump into the scripture. Like I say, the first part is about the big picture. I know this is speaking to Israel. God here is speaking to Israel. But we are the Israel of God through faith. So the Israel of God is a spiritual thing. It's not a blood thing. So we know he loves all mankind. He made all of us. So he must love us. So it's not just these per people that are descendants of Abraham or whatever. It's for anyone who puts their faith in him. That's what makes you a child of God. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 25 to 35. And it says... When you shall father children, remember, as, as a, also as a back note, so to speak, he's giving a, a, a prophecy here. And if you'll notice the speech he uses, he doesn't say, if you do this. He says, when you do when this. And he's talking about their failure. He's talking about their failure because he knows he gave the law not so they could obey it. He gave the law so they could see how in need of the mercy of God they are. Because they're always stubborn. You know that word stiff neck? You stiff neck people. Stiff neck just means that they're, they are not bowing themselves in, in obedience, but in the obedience of faith as in believing and trusting. Oh, I can't do this. I can't obey the law. The first man and woman made by the hands of God, Adam and Eve, disobeyed him. And they had one little command. It wasn't even thou shalt not kill. It was don't eat from that tree. And they couldn't do it. So we know we can't obey. So that's the stiff neck part of our nature right. is insisting we can obey. And then when you look and you read through Exodus and Deuteronomy and everything, they are constantly insisting we will obey, we will obey, we will do what you tell us to do. And they can't. So he gives us prophecy right here. Let's just jump right in. I can say Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 35. When you shall father children and children's children, and you shall have been long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves. Mary didn't say if. He said, you're going to do this. And yeah. shall corrupt yourselves and make a carved image in the form of anything. And shall do that which is evil in Yahweh, your God's sight, to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from off the land which you go over the Jordan to possess it. So this is in Moses' time. But he's talking about a time after Moses is gone and, and after Joshua has led them into the land of milk and honey. They are going to do this thing. He's just telling them what's going to happen. You will not prolong your days on it, but will utterly be destroyed. Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahweh will lead you away. There you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands wood and stone which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell 
that tells you something. Our God, he can see, he can hear, and he can eat, and he can smell, because we know who our God is. But from there, you shall seek Yahweh your God, and you shall find him. When? When you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in oppression and all these things have come on you, in the latter days, you shall return to Yahweh your God and listen to his voice. For Yahweh your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and from the one end of the sky to the other, whether there has been anything as this great thing, or has been heard like it? Did a people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the middle of the fire, as you have heard and live? Or has God tried to go and take a nation for himself from among another nation? By trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? It was shown to you so that you might know that Yahweh is God. There is no one else besides him. So this is a testimony of what they're going to do. And they did it. Of course, they, all, they always did it. And they were always scattered. And they would get retrieved. And they would come back and they'd have a little success. And they'd get a good king or a bad king. And then they'd go off after these other gods. Because they are always stiff-necked. They are always thinking they could obey God. And whenever we do that, whenever you insist that I will do this thing out of your own determination and your own flesh, whether it's be good or be obedient, whatever it is, you always end up failing. And when I say fail, I don't mean as in you necessarily don't do that thing you determine to do, but something you don't want to do will come out some other way. It's like I had this illustration where like if you had a balloon and say this balloon is your sin, it represents your sin. Oh, that thing there. I'm not going to do that. We scrunch it down and the balloon just gets big over here. So I was like, I wasn't very prideful, but I said, decided, well, I'm, I'm going to be a person who never says a bad word. And then I scrunch it down and then over here I become prideful because, oh, now I don't swear. So I'm better than you and I'm better than all those other people that do. And I can compare myself to everyone and I can see that I'm better than people. And that's what God is trying to point us towards is that, he is Yahweh. He is the Lord. There is none else. And that has a great meaning. It's not just that he is one and there is none else. It means that he, there is no other answer. There is no other solution. There is no other comfort. There is no other knowledge. There is no other peace. There is no other understanding. There is no other thing that I need besides him. There are other things I need. Like I said, I need food. I need love from humans. But those things are all going to go away. The only thing that's not going to go away is God. And that's why I know he is the ultimate in everything. Because he gave me my food. He gave me other people. He gave me my opportunities to succeed in business. Or do whatever it is I think I should be doing. So he is the answer. That's why him being the, the one and there is none else beside him is so important. It's not just a matter of is he three people or not. Because obviously he's not three people. He's one individual person. We are made in his likeness. I'm made in the likeness of an individual. And I know that's radical. A lot of people think that. Oh, God's an individual. That can't be possible. No, he is an individual. That's why I know I'm made in his likeness. Because they always focus on image. And image is important, obviously. But those are two different things. The Hebrew word for image meant to reflect. And so we reflect. That was the way he designed us. Adam and Eve to reflect who he is. And the likeness is what we are as an individual. I can relate to him one individual to another. That's a specific point that he's trying to make about that. So I look, can look at my world and say, my world, the world that I've been placed in, or maybe if I deny him and say, oh, I'm just here and there is no God, and all my answers in the world are in the world. My happiness, my fulfillment, my wisdom, my knowledge, my understanding, my peace, it's all from this stuff. Then I never get it. I can't ever get it because I'm not, I'm not, turning towards the reality of the source of all those things. Those things aren't the, the source of themselves. Obviously, he has a psalm where he says, did we make ourselves? Well, obviously we didn't. And we didn't make the world we live in. The world didn't make itself. There's one who did. Only one. 
And when we get in touch with that, then the seeking really begins. And he says, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. It's not that you find him and then you're done. It's just a, it's a never ending journey. You found him and now you're going to be searching the depths of his heart for all eternity. From this point on, for in this life, we actually have heaven. We have entered into the kingdom through faith. And it just, it's obviously going to change when we enter into the, the actual kingdom and leave this dimension. But we are in, in the kingdom here. That's why we are saved, as in past tense. You get saved. You don't get saved until you screw up next time. You are saved forever once you are saved. I want to finish with these last three scriptures to deal more specifically with the issue at hand. And that is of, of a move that's being made. And the first one is Isaiah 52, 12. For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight. That just means like fleeing. You're not, you're not right. fleeing. For Yahweh is going before you, and your rear God is the God of Israel. So that's the wonderful thing about the omnipresent God. He is not only in front of you, guy in the way. He is behind you, guarding you and protecting you. And those things are obviously spiritual things. Because Israel went to war and they had their God in front of them and their God behind them. Some people didn't make it through the war. But the thing is, is that they knew whether they lived or died or survived in that battle, their God was with them. Because this is all temporary. So it's not that he's going to keep me from never dying. It's that he's going to keep me in his arms and no one can snatch me from his hand. That has nothing to do with this world that I'm living in now. I am in his hand and he made a promise and I believe it. So if I go there, I stay here or I go there, whatever I do, he's in front of me and he's behind me. He's guarding me. He's protecting me. He has his wings around me, as it says in the Psalms, which is another beautiful thing. The next one is also in Isaiah and that's Isaiah 58, 8. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall grow quickly, and your salvation shall go before you. The glory of Yahweh will be your rear guard. I know it says a similar thing as the last one did. It's just in a different way. I just like to put it in there because I like that whole notion, and I believe in it. It's not just because it's poetic. I believe that he is before me. He is behind me. He's with me. He's in me. His very spirit lives in my heart. So I know that he's with me. And he is looking out for me. I, there's probably things I'm never going to know until I do reach the other side. Things that angels have done. And other things like that. Or just things where, where all of a sudden I was, in a, I was in a bad situation. And for some reason I just had peace in my heart. Well, can I manufacture peace? Can I do that? Can I just generate it out of my will? Of course not. God gives me that. He gives it to you because you're seeking him. Because you're trusting him. Because even when you know you're in the wilderness... I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. This is just too much. He comes in and he gives you peace. Right. And it says it's a peace that can't be explained. That's what the Bible says. He gives you peace that you can't even explain what it is or define it. But yet you have it. You possess something that you can't explain. But yet you know you have it. And you can't give it to someone else because only he can give it. He's the only one that can give it. And we know that. That's, what, that's how you know you have a connection with your God. Because he gives you something that is totally unique between you and him. I can, I can tell someone about it, but I can't give it to them. I can only say, well, search, ask, seek, talk to him, and he'll give it to you too. Because I know, because he gave it to me. But until they do it themselves, that's never going to happen. And finally, still in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold... Darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the peoples. But upon thee the Lord will arise, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And that's just a wonderful thing. And you know, if you keep this as you're traveling.